Thank you. I feel like I'm introducing the Beatles. I'm so, uh, I'm so thrilled and honored. Before I just want to tell you, it, I've been in as a film critic for a long time, and it used to be 10, 15 years ago. We used to laugh at the TV critics. We used to th be so smug. We used to think, you know, they they had to review the crap, and we got all the we got all the plum assignments. And now they walk around incredibly smug because while I'm inter while I'm reviewing uh, some 200 million dollar Marvel franchise superhero installment. They get to write about one of the greatest shows in the history of television, Breaking Bad. But now, but now I get to introduce the guy who, in the new uh, really good book by Brett Martin uh, called Difficult Men, uh, is the one showrunner of a great show who is a not difficult man, and that is Vince Gilligan. And I've long dreamed of saying this. It's Aaron Paul, bitches! <laughs> Last but not least, the man under the Heisenberg mask, the man who knocks and watch out for your children and your wives. <laughs> Brian Cranston. Hey. Thanks for coming. Okay, I don't know about you guys, but this has been the slowest building cult phenomenon in the history of television. You began as a very well-reviewed, well-respected show. You racked up a, a few Emmys. Um, but uh, how do you account for this insanity, this love, this, uh, I understand uh, Mark Johnson emailed me that in Iceland on the street, people are wearing Heisenberg t-shirts. <laughs> World in Europe, you guys are a sensation. How, what happened? Uh, and what does it say about the medium and, and the new way that we, that we experience television that you guys are now at kind of the apex of this wave? We're in the empire business. <laughs> I don't know, I, I think it's, it's a testament to Vince Gilligan and the, the quiet genius that he is. And I was first introduced to that 10 years ago when I guest starred on a, a one episode of, um, of X-Files. And uh, he wrote this brilliant character. And the, the nuanced uh, character that he wrote was so intriguing and so delicate. Uh, and, and laid the groundwork for this, uh, this anti-hero of Walter White. But it's really him. He, he's the guy. He and his staff have created this environment that is both toxic and attractive at the same time. And, I, and what's happened is that not only do we witness, you know, incredibly conflicted drama in the show, but it's, he's been able to instill that incredibly conflicted drama in the viewers, in the fans of the show. Because you, wait, am I supposed to like him? I don't like him. I don't know what I'm feeling. And, and it's pulling you in. And it's, uh, it's a beautiful thing in an ugly way. <laughs> Is that a, would you say that you'd like that on your tombstone? He was a beautiful thing in an ugly way? Oh, yes. Uh, that would be a very good uh, tombstone indeed. Uh, and you know, not just because we're here in the Apple store, but uh, not to blow a little smoke Apple's way, but, but I think uh, I, the iTunes, the availability of, of Breaking Bad on iTunes and on, and on Netflix and on these various platforms of, uh, of uh, video on demand that uh, exist now that did, have not existed for, for too, too long now uh, are another reason that the show, I mean, I'm proud as hell of this show and I'm proud as hell of these two gentlemen who've really made this what it is. Uh, they and the other cast have just really, all the good reasons to watch the show aside, this, this, this new technology uh, coming, uh, coming online at, a, at about season two or thereabouts, uh, coming on in earnest, uh, really 
uh, I think it's one of the reasons we're here today, that we're able to be here and, and that we didn't get canceled round about season two or three for lack of viewers. The, the ability for people to instantly catch up with what is a very hyper-serialized show, uh, all credit, you know, or a great deal of that credit has to be given to this new technology. Yeah. And uh, our, you know, badass fans. They just, yes. Yes. you know, uh, they just love talking about the show. They love t introducing people to the show. It's, it's fun to talk about, so thank you all. Um, Vince, one of, one of the worst uh, evenings of my television watching life was actually the last two hours of Battlestar Galactica, which was not just bad, it was retroactively bad. It seemed to wipe out the entire, the good that was in the entire five years leading up to that. Lost was almost as bad. Uh, the Sopranos threw us a little bit, but on balance I'd say they did pretty well. You, you have a last episode coming up, you have a final arc. Um, that's, that's a lot of pressure, man, uh, because we're so invested. Um, You're not helping any, man. <laughs> Just don't fuck it up. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that you are correct. It's a great deal of pressure, uh, and it's a great deal of pressure for the wonderful fans of the show who've been with us since day one and who have, uh, and for the fans who have not necessarily been with us since day one but who have embraced the show uh, having caught up on it, some folks having caught up on it very quickly in the course of a weekend. Uh, you know, David, David Blaine watched the entire show without sleeping. He actually did. He, he, he did it in one, no joke. That's his next trick. That's his next, yeah, he did it in Tooth one picks. sitting without sleeping. Was he encased in a block of ice? I'm sure he was, was yeah. but yeah. Well, that's I, I, <laughs> true. I think he had some of Heisenberg's uh, uh, product there maybe to help him. I bet it's how, no, I've known people who've done that and they come up with the jitters. It's like, it's like, the, it's a rush. You mean trying the product or watching the show? <laughs> Probably both, I think. But no, the show gives you a rush and, and it does, it does divide you. So, so breaking bad, I'd never heard the phrase breaking bad before the show. Uh, I guess um, the only thing I can compare it to is, you know, in The Sopranos, there was a famous episode in the first season where Tony Soprano, who we've very much liked, murders a man in cold blood that he sees in Maine. And it was a, a, a sort of a rat who was in the witness protection program. It was a huge turning point in how we looked at protagonists, you know, in series like this, who we loved, who we identified with. Um, for me, uh, you know, I was with Walt through all the killings, all the meth manufacturing, uh, you know, even... <laughs> Maybe even the murder of Gail, but it was when he watched Jane choke to death on her own vomit and didn't intercede that I thought, whoa, this is something I've never seen on television before. Now we have to look at that guy. What was that like for, for, for you to do, and what kind of discussions were there? Because that was a momentous, momentous scene. Do you want to start that, or do you want to? Uh, you can do it. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about before it came to the point of Brian acting it, uh, which I was lucky enough to have been there for, and, and, and that was not always the case. I very often was not in Albuquerque when we were shooting. Uh, more's the pity, for, as far as I'm concerned, because I had such a good time watching the show get shot. But your, uh, your writer's room is in L.A. Writer's room was in Burbank, uh, California, 800 miles away, and that was the most important place I could be. But that uh, is a very good example of uh, a really... Honestly, the the only example uh, of 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 a moment in time where the network in the studio called me up and said, "Are you sure you want to do this?" Or rather, to be precise, they said, "Are you sure you want to do this this soon into the run of the series?" Because they were on board with the idea of of uh, Breaking Bad being what I had pitched them, which was uh, taking a good guy, turning him into a bad guy, or rather, he by sheer force of his own will you know, descends down a path of criminality and, 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 you know, becomes darker and darker episode by episode. Having said that, when that particular uh, episode came along, we were only probably 18, 19 episodes into the run of the whole series. Uh, the run of the series ultimately, though we did not know it at the time, uh, destined to be 62 episodes. So we weren't even a third of the way through. And that was a very dark moment indeed. And, and the, the powers that be said, are you sure you want to do this this quickly? And, and uh, they, to their credit, uh, I, was, I said, oh, yeah, I'm nervous too. But uh, to their credit, we discussed it, and then we, we went ahead and, and did it. It was one of those times when I 
read a script and went, holy shit. Uh, because we knew we were going down the path, but when you're talking about a subjective issue, uh, you, it's, it differs with every person. So in the initial draft, it had um, Walt sitting on the bed, uh, distraught about what's become of him, and he looks at this girl, and she starts to choke, but she's on her side, and Walt takes her shoulder, almost as a caress, and then pushes her back. So he's directly culpable with the murder, so he pushes her on her back so that she would choke to death. And the, and the, the network in the studio went, wait a minute, wait, no, no, no. So we, we talked and talked and talked about it, but, but Vince came up with a great solution. And, and this is truly where, where the collaboration of studio and network and the creators um, got together and for the, for the betterment of, of the show. And it turned out that uh, it would be an accident, but that he would have to make that omission, that act of omission in order for her to die. So as it turned out, he's shaking Jesse and she is jostled by it and falls back on her back, but he did not do that. Then when he notices her choking, he initially, impulsively, goes to help. And by the time he circles the bed to go help, he realizes, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is the woman who is blackmailing me, and if she lives, then she is going to do that, and that's not good for me, and that's not bad. And then I look at her again, and but she's a little girl. She's a young, she could be my daughter. Look at her, she's innocent, you know. But she just got Jesse on, on heroin, and she's going to kill him if I let her, you know. So he's going back and forth and back and forth with this, with this panic of what to do, what to do. And then we start to see her go, and then he just is, he's overcome with, with grief and sorrow for a moment of, what have I done? I've become inhuman. I've become cold. And then, and then she goes. And then there was one more moment that we wanted to pull out, and that is, get over it. What a dick. <laughs> But you know, you know what's uh, so sad about this whole this whole thing. I mean, it's obviously such a, a intense thing for Brian to to get into just that headspace. The moment they said cut on that scene, we all had to get together to do our cast and crew photo, which is <laughs> and I'm weeping. He's and weeping and he's just trying to pull together, and but uh, it just took over him. But it's beautiful work, my friend. Beautiful work, Vince. When I just I think just listening to Brian describe the the beats, the kind of dramatic beats, the psychological beats of that moment confirms to me the genius of your casting him and the genius of the performance. You've said that uh, he, he's somebody who can be a bad guy and yet at the same time be somebody who draws you in emotionally in everything he does. And I guess in the way he anatomizes a moment like that would be the key. Absolutely correct. And and the shame of it is we, we shoot on uh, we shoot on thirty five millimeter film, which is uh, which is one of the one of the last shows ever to do that. Which picks up no offense to the HD video, but it picks up damn near everything that any photographic medium could pick up. I was there behind the camera watching. I was not directing. I just happened to be in a very prime spot watching. And I and I I'm telling you, I'm here to tell you, there was stuff. There, was, there were nuances that even the, the camera did not pick up that day. There were things that I saw being blessed to watch it happen in real life, what was going on in, in Brian's face, that uh, I didn't see in the final, in the final uh, product, in the final filmed version of it. And, and as good as the final film version was, and I think you folks can uh, attest to that, there was something more still. There was, there was, it was electric being in the room. I, I don't... I don't talk that way normally but it really was it was like it was fascinating to watch the, the power uh that brian's performance had uh particularly in, in that in that moment it was uh, i'd never seen anything like it jesse you get oh. <laughs> i get it all the time yeah bitch <laughs> it's all right 
Mr. Mr. Paul. Yes, um, Mr. Paul. <laughs> You, you have to act uh, complete credulousness where, uh, where Mr. White is concerned. And I wonder how, he, now he's done a lot of terrible things. He's poisoned a kid. Uh, he never... <laughs> he lived. <laughs> well, you did, you did kill Mike. Mike didn't survive. Um, so um, at a certain point, Jesse has become, you have become the moral center of the show in a certain way. And I wonder, as an actor, how, how do you maintain that sort of beautiful obliviousness? I have no idea. <laughs> I mean, it's all in the, it's, you know, like Brian was saying, it's all um, because of our fearless leader over here, Vince Gilligan, and the brilliant staff of writers we have. We are um, so, so blessed on a weekly basis. I mean, we all know. Uh, there hasn't been a shitty episode of Breaking Bad ever. And the final eight are just, it's, I, I can't wait for you guys to see it because you all know. Well, we're here each, if you want to. Yeah, I'll tell you. What do you guys want to know? Roll tape. Um, yeah. Each season, as any fan of Breaking Bad knows, uh, Breaking Bad gets progressively darker. And um, the final eight hours of this TV show is just such a violent brutal sprint, but um, I just, I love you, Vince. <laughs> we all love you, Vince. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, it's just, it's on the page. And so um, I'm just lucky enough to be so closely involved with this show, to play Jesse. I love him. Well, Vince, you have, you, you've, you have in your mind uh, Walter White and Jesse Pinkman. You have, you cast Brian Cranston and Aaron Paul. Um, at what point um, did um, Brian Cranston and Aaron Paul, how far did they move in? How far did uh, Walter White and Jesse Pinkman move till they, till they met in the middle? Do you, un do you know what I mean? No, I know exactly what you mean. It's a very good question. And, and, you know, this is a wonderfully collaborative medium. And, and that is a very exciting thing to me, television. I mean, Movies are too, but television especially, because it goes on, hopefully, for years on end. The, the stuff I wrote, if you went back and read that pilot episode, was the one and only, which was the one and only time I was working on this show by myself. I, I'm proud of that pilot episode, but there was so much lacking in it. There's so much missing from it. Uh, there are nuances to uh, Walt's character, to, to Jesse's character, that... that not in a million years of, of, of writing alone in a room by myself could I have come up with on my own. Uh, it's the, the, the product of, of, first and foremost, these gentlemen and who they are. It's a product of working with other writers. Uh, it's a product of working with their entire crew. Same goes for a character like uh, Hank, played by Dean Norris. The, the character in that first episode, the, the, the only time I worked on this show by myself, was was a very different character than what he became. Uh, and, and first and foremost, it was getting to know that, that man, that actor. So this is the wonderful thing about television as a collaborative medium. And, it, and it, 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 what's the old expression? I mean, it's synergy, which was a big word in Hollywood a few years ago. But the idea that the, uh, the, uh, the sum is, is equal to more than the, the uh, arithmetical total of the parts. And, and, and it really, synergy as far as like big corporations and whatnot goes, I don't know if that, works, but uh, it, it, it certainly does on a, on a TV series. Can you, can you be specific about, say, Aaron, about how he changed the character, how the character evolved with him in the role? Well, the, the best example, uh, you guys are probably, a lot of you guys have probably heard it before, but I'll, I'll say it again, because it is the best example, is uh, I was going to kill the character off. Uh, that, was my, that was my plan. Uh, Damn. <laughs> what a dick. <laughs> But uh, the original plan I had, you know, in that brief period working, working by myself on this thing, I thought of Jesse Pinkman being uh, Walter White's entree into the world of criminality. And once he had fulfilled that purpose, that was, that was his purpose. There, there wasn't really anything more for him to uh, accomplish. And uh, at that point, he would, would die very horribly. And uh, Are we talking about season one? Uh, yeah, that was my original plan for the end of season one. And, and it wasn't even going to be like the cliffhanger, right? It was just towards the end. You know, it, it might have been. You might have made it to the end of the season. Okay. <laughs> but 
and, and you know, this is the problem sometimes that derives from when you work by yourself. This was a situation where I was thinking in uh, sort of logistical terms, sort of, I was thinking mechanically. Uh, Hank Schrader, you know, in that first episode exists to be everything Walter on the on paper to, to exist to be everything Walter White is not. Uh, Jesse Pinkman exists on paper to get Walt into the world of illegal drugs and then F.O., you know, Amscray. And, uh, and, 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 and that drives, uh, or would have in an alternate reality, drives Walt to, uh, to be very uh, guilt-ridden and then to go out and seek revenge. And so uh, the good answer to the question, uh, you know, what, what, did Jesse, uh, what did Aaron Paul bring to the role of Jesse Pinkman is he was so damn good in the role that I knew by the end of, by halfway through uh, episode one, that there was no way I was going to cut off my nose to spite my face. There's no way I was going to kill off this character. At least not then. Okay, so, so, so. Shouldn't have said that. Thank God that didn't happen. Thank you for keeping At least around not yet. back then. Yeah. I just want to pin you down a little bit. Was it that he was so beautifully, gorgeously dopey and innocent and, you know, Ooh. and and just so wonderfully credulous and still referring to after all these years to Mr. White and was, what, what specifically did you respond to in this guy and their relationship? He's just a star. Look at this guy. He's just a <laughs> look at both these guys. I think the I, charm. charm? Well, I, well, listen, a lot of guys out there can be charming. A lot of guys can be uh, dopey. I know I can. You know, so there's got to be more to it than that. But uh, I... You know, it sounds like a love fest up here, one of these, like, you know, blowing smoke, you know, at each other. But the, the real truth of it is, is, is when you have actors this good, and, and the answer is it's the whole package. It's the ability to, to, to play uh, just an, 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 an incredibly wide range of emotions, play them all credibly, play the highest highs and the lowest lows, play the dopey moments, play the uh, more importantly than the dopey moments, because a lot of people honestly can do dopey, play the, play the affecting moments, play them without uh, going for the maudlin or the, you know, no, you know, the pathos rather than the bathos of it all, you know, just being authentic, just knowing how to do it innately. And, and you got two guys had these two guys up here, and we were lucky to have uh, other actors as well in our ensemble who were also just wonderfully authentic and talented and folks that uh, you'd, you'd be uh, foolish as a, as a, as a, as a showrunner to, to uh, not make proper use of and to get rid of too soon, if at all. To kill, to kill there's, a, yeah. there's also a, a component that, I mean, Aaron is uh, a, a brilliant actor, and he's never lazy. He is always all in. He's always willing to work. And we discovered that in the first, in the pilot episode. And what Vince then discovered is that, wow, putting these two characters, keeping them together, created an oil and water situation, which allowed for Vince and us to play the natural humor that came out. And the humor was so germane to the to the character situation. It was never jokey. There was never, it was, it, Walter White has never thought that anything that's been going on the last two years had any sense of humor to it whatsoever. But it's just the incredulousness that he looks at, at poor Jesse Pinkman in his delicious ignorance. Is that what you said? <laughs> um, and, and shake his head. And, and, and so they were an oil and water mix. And I think, Vince, you, you saw that early on and were able to, to make it naturally happen. Brian, you just um, really thrilled the, the Comic Con audience by, if you guys don't know this, walking, making an appearance, wearing a Heisenberg mask, and mingling with the audience, and then going up on stage and taking it off to show that you were you walked among them. Um, what was interesting to me, apart from the fact that it was so cool, was that. Uh, Walter White has been wearing that mask on the series for at least the last season. In fact, what we've seen um, in the last season is that the Heisenberg mask has supplanted the face. I'm wondering if you, if you agree with that and if you also, in the last eight episodes, I know you can't spoil anything, 
we see Walter White and Heisenberg, maybe Walter White rising a little bit, uh, or, or if you think that that mask has firmly taken hold? Uh, well, it's, it's very interesting because I, I looked at it as a, as a Walter White uh, mask. Um, because, I, you know, the thing, the, the talisman that Walt found in the pork pie hat was incredibly important for him. And we talked about transitions and passages as we go. Where, where are we at in, in telling this story and the transition, the metamorphosis of Walter White? And there's a couple nuanced things that has, have happened in the course of the show. And some of them didn't get any play at all, but it's important to us. And I think it, it sets a subliminal tone to the audience. And one of them was when, season three maybe, um, when he was told that his cancer is in remission and he's going to grow his hair back. And yet he purposefully shaves his head still. And that, to me, was a big moment because he is then accepting, embracing who he is now and, uh, and so in some ways celebrating it. But I think he needed, I think Walt needed Heisenberg. I don't think he had the courage the gumption to be able to pull off what he needed to pull off just by having a bald head. He needed that hat. He needed those glasses. And, and it felt different when I put it on. I, my shoulders went back. My posture was more erect. And my chest was out. Not dissimilar from what happens in a bar fight. Do you know? He was in a bar fight. He needed to have a little more power to him. You see two guys go at it, what happens? The first thing they do is they throw their chest out, just like in nature. You see birds do that, and animals making themselves look bigger. And that's what Walt needed. He needed to feel like he was bigger. He needed to, to look bigger and feel bigger. And that's where Heisenberg came in. Not, not to be reductive, but did, that, uh, did a lot of that come from losing the woman he loved and being deprived of this enormous fortune, something that he that simmered within him all those years and that finally burst out in this, this new creation, this combination of Walt and Heisenberg? Well, it's, yes, I mean, that's, that's certainly a component to it. But as much as, the, as Vince and the writers laid in the foundation of, this, of the building blocks of this character, I just kept grabbing them and taking them. So in the beginning, you see this poor schlub who is, is turning 50, He's, he's overweight, he's pasty, he's got no color to his skin, he's, he sees a sea of apathy in, in his students, nobody gives a shit about learning chemistry. He then gets embarrassed at his second job that he needs because of his special needs son, and, he, you know, and all these things add up, and that's the hook. He baited that hook, and he just dangled it out for the audience to see, and they went, Whoa! they grabbed on it, and everyone said, that poor son of a bitch, I care about him, and he, just, he wants to do right, and he, he's, he's a milk toast, but he wants to do one thing in his life that was bold, that was risky, and he took that. And so every little thing was a pull from then on. And then, as Vince says a lot, talking about uh, the Schwartzes, you know, Gretchen and Elliot, and how they offered to pay for my treatment, and another turning point there. And almost like you're trying to spit the hook, but you can't anymore. And he says, no. Uh, he says, fuck you. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to take your charity. I'm going to do this on my own. And so all of a sudden, we see a glimpse of, of ego and hubris that is starting to emerge. And you start to see the change in this man. It's just fascinating. It's really a sociological study to me. I think I just realized why we love him, even as vile as he's become, because he is a classic existential hero. He is somebody who has, who has created him, who creates himself anew every day. Um, you guys have been, you, you two have been incredible Emmy hogs in the last couple of years. You, uh, man, you just... You know, I don't really have an intelligent question. I just want to say, wow, that's so amazing. What was it like? Or what's it been, what's it been like to get that level of attention for what, had, what was a very sm had a very small audience at a certain point? 
It's awesome. <laughs> no, I, I, no, it's, uh, it's, I mean, it's just, it, it's an embarrassment of, uh, of riches, really. I mean, we talk about this all the time, you know, it's just, we're so lucky to, um, to work in this business because we just love acting so much. But then on top of that, we're so lucky to be involved in something that we're so proud of. And then on top of it, other people are really excited about it as well. And then the accolades are just, I mean, it's just so bizarre. You know, we're going to work every single day. I mean, we, we catch ourselves just kind of laughing because it's just, it's not fair. It really, it's really not. I mean, this show is so, we know, we know that this show is so, so special. And we have a front row, um, front row seat to the entire thing. And so it's, um, it's phenomenal. So again, Vince, I love you. Thank you so much. Brian, uh, you know, Brian, everybody, everybody in the world is, uh, agrees on, on you, on your performance. Everybody, maybe not John Hamm, but you know, um, uh, it's been an extra, extra. It was, uh, I was, uh, we were at the Emmys last year, and um, who won? Someone won. I didn't win. It was uh, Damien Lewis. Lewis. So Damien Lewis wins, and... Uh, I was presenting, so I go backstage and in the green room, um, waiting to be, you know, brought in to make an announcement. And uh, John Hamm comes up to me, and he says, "It gets easier." <laughs> <laughs> what a class act! He he does have more endorsements than you do, though. Yeah, I he think. Does, he does. <laughs> you know, actually, that reminds. I just want to say one thing. You know, I I. I'm a film critic, right? So I don't really get to r write about you, but I do see a lot of your performances with hair on um, in in various big budget movies, and and in Drive you had a really wonderful complex role. Um, and and if and if I may say, you died beautifully. Um, but but. Um, you know, I often find myself, maybe this pisses the hell out of you, going like, well, Brian Cranston is in it, he's a general, or he's a bureaucrat, he has hair. Um, when is this guy going to get a movie role that shows his incredible stature? Um, I, I don't know, is that, I mean, is that on the horizon, I hope? Um, you know, uh, to, to, to echo uh, Aaron's comments earlier, this is the greatest uh, experience of our lives. This is the greatest role I've had in my life. And if everything ended today, and the opening line of our eventual obituary is, you know, breaking bad actors die in a plunge off the Brooklyn Bridge, <laughs> so be it. We'll be very proud of that. Um, any, anything you gain beyond m being able to make a living in this business is gravy. Just gravy. No, one's, no one owes you anything. The business doesn't owe you anything. Life doesn't owe you anything. Whatever comes along. So um, I'm very, uh, you know, I mean, I, I love my role in Argo. And I had, it, it, because it's about story. Yeah. And so that's what it first attracted me to this. It's about the story. So it's not about the character. In fact, it, to me, when I judge projects, it's about story first, uh, the script second. Does the script support the story? And then it's the character. What's, what's so special about the character? Is it integral to the plot? Is it important? And then for, on from there. But um, I decided, you know, I'm, I, I didn't want to do anything that competes with this. And I just, you know, it, the, the, the fan reaction to Breaking Bad and the, the zeitgeist, if you will, of what's happened with this is so big that I need to step back. I need to step away for a while. I think it's become too ubiquitous of me to be front and center. So I'm very excited. I'm, I, I did take a role that I'm going to be doing a play. I'm going to be playing Lyndon Johnson in a, in a, in a play, yeah, which is uh, this guy is, wow. He's like King Lear. And so I'm very excited to be able to, to change the, the, the philosophy. And the actors in the, in the group know this, is that the, the process of, of rehearsing a play and, and doing f film and television work is, is really the polar opposite of each other. 
So I'm looking forward to doing that process. In, in New York? Or? I'm going to be doing it in Boston. I'm going to do it at ART. At ART? Oh, ART. excellent. Mid-September to mid-October. So come on out and see it. And are, are you guys, uh, I really am going to get to you, are you guys just being proactive um, about looking for roles? Do you have production companies yet? Are you affiliated with any? I mean, you have a co-producer credit on Breaking Bad. Do you, are you doing anything behind the scenes to generate better material and to support great filmmakers? Yes. Oh, well, I have a, a television production deal with Sony Television, our studio. And um, that's developing nice. I have four projects in various degrees of, of development. And, um, you know, we'll see how that progresses. So I'm interested in that end to, to nurture the, the next generation of writer uh, into whatever that may be. And it's not doing something for me to star in, but just looking for the next great story. Do you, do you want to hire me in something? <laughs> I might consider yeah. it. Yeah. Are you, are you looking actively? Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, whoever will have me. Yeah. I think you so, can. Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, I, I've, I've been working, um, you know, random. Uh, I went to a job directly. Actually, it was such a sad story. Uh, the, um, I, I had the privilege of working on the final day of shooting. We were actually shooting... Uh, a scene from a previous episode. Careful. What? All right. No, we were shooting a scene from a previous episode. They they had to save. They saved it to the final day. I'm not gonna say what it is. Um, what a dick. Um, but uh, <laughs> anyways, uh, we all got matching tattoos at the end of the day. We we did. It was great. Um, and then I got I got on a plane that night and started the next day on, the, on a film. But. Um, it was a. Uh, it was. It was it's a nice problem to have. It is a nice. It is a nice problem. But I. I landed at this small little airport in the middle of nowhere, uh, outside of Mendocino, um, California, and no one was there. Uh, the airport was closed. No one was there to pick me up. And I was in the rain, literally in the rain for two hours. It's so sad that the the show was over, and then now I'm going to this other job that no one even cares to pick me up. And. <laughs> It was, it was, I'm like, what is happening with my life? I'm just staring at my new tattoo, <laughs> rubbing it, saying, I miss you, Brian. Um, Which is that is what your what? tattoo says? I miss you, Brian? Yeah, it says, I miss you, Brian, here. No, what, what are the matching tattoos? Well, well, not matching, actually. They're not matching, but they're the Breaking Bad-related tattoos. Um, a lot of people um, on our crew got uh, no half measures. Um, which I got, and then Brian... I, I can't show you where my tattoo is. <laughs> Oh, but it wow. was painful. <laughs> his his says uh, his says brb. It says Albuquerque. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and that Albuquerque is such a great character on the show too. The, the sense of place and the skyline and the clouds. Uh, Vince, you know, recently Sony released an interactive digital multi-touch book exclusively on the iBookstore called Breaking Bad Alchemy. It's called Breaking Bad Alchemy, and it is a, uh, it, I think uh, there's some uh, footage for, not footage, but it's, it's, it's this very uh, interesting uh, 21st century book that you scroll through on your iPad and you touch the different characters and different uh, bits of video come up, different uh, uh, exclusive interviews, uh, different exclusive audio interviews. Uh, and it was a lot of fun uh, to work on. Uh, and uh, it's, it's just, I am very impressed by the technology. And the neat thing about it is that it, uh, it's like buying a book that will continue to get updated as uh, you know, different editions come out. You keep it, you plug it in, and, and different uh, versions uh, uh, update uh, onto your uh, onto your iPad. And uh, we are indeed living in the future. And I've I've had a lot of fun playing with it. It's got underpants on it that you, you tap, and then you can rotate them around. They're, they're nice. I don't know why you need to do that, but I think it's completely awesome. <laughs> it's got the Heisenberg hat. You can you can flip it around in every possible direction. It's this 3D model that is pretty amazing, and then. It's got this cool uh, chapter toward the end. We had these uh, challenge coins that I would make up for the crew. Uh, they were uh, uh, these these sort of commemorative coins I'd give to the to our crew at the end of every season to to commemorate working on the show. And we got a whole chapter just about 
them. And so it's got a lot of inside baseball stuff if you're a fan. And, and the folks who created it did a wonderful job, and I would recommend checking it out. I mean, if you're a fan of the show, it's definitely going to give you some, uh, you know, new information about it. So it's great. It's got like a, it's like a hundred pages long. It, like, yeah, it's, and it's, after it's, each it's, episode, it's actually airs, very cool. New, it gets updated. New stuff with pops new, up. Yeah, yeah. It's, very, it's very cool. I, you know, we're living in the future. Like I said, yeah. it's like Star Trek land or something. Yeah. It's very cool. And now, what you've been waiting for? Hi, um, I have a question for Vince, and this has been something that's burning in my gut all summer. After I found out that Mr. Cranston's script was stolen out of his car, I found myself really upset thinking that as a result you had to go back and rewrite certain things or reshoot certain things and that we're not getting the ending that you had originally intended for us. So I have to know if this is the real ending or if this is like a plan B. All he had to change was the that Jesse was going to get a sex change operation. <laughs> We had to adjust that idea a little he bit. He always talks about this. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Bless your heart for asking. Uh, we, we really... Uh, Bastard. It was, uh, we, we really did not go backward. You, the ending you're going to see uh, is, is the ending that we, we always intended. Uh, that was one of the earlier episodes. You were, you were up doing... You were on, it was a weekend, and you were, you were being a good guy. You were scouting... You were like for free on the weekend, scouting locations, helping us find a spot to shoot something, and there was some a, there jag off were, breaks into your car. Yeah, yeah. there was an idea that, that, that we're, we actually used uh, in a certain location, and uh, so I wanted to go up and take a look at it and take some pictures, and, and I wasn't gone five minutes, and someone busted in my car and just took my stuff. Awful. Awful. But uh, He's uh, dead now. Luckily, they... <laughs> They actually, they actually caught the guy, right? They caught they, the they guy. They did catch him. Yeah. Yeah, they caught the guy. And he was trying to sell the script at a strip club <laughs> in the middle of the afternoon. No, no joke. True story. It was actually about 10.30 in the morning <laughs> in a strip an club. Oh, my God. I don't get That's there until noon. Yeah. I just, yeah. uh, I don't, yeah. you know. <laughs> Otherwise, you're a loser if you're, if you're in a strip club before noon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hi. Um, first of all, the show is just completely amazing. You guys are so incredibly talented. Um, second of all, in the world of criminality and drugs and everything in between that Vince Gilligan has created, has um, the drug world been more exploited or romanticized in the show? I don't think it's been romanticized at, at all. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, there's with enough, you know, the, well, the, the, the lady choking to death on her, on her own vomit, that was kind of romantic. It was, it was, yeah. <laughs> mm, tell me more. <laughs> uh, it, it uh, no, it's a good question. I, I think, uh, I think um, we uh, have, have endeavored to be as authentic as possible. I say that as the most boring, non drug using person ever lived right the, the, how i came to be uh, uh running a show like this is is kind of a story unto itself and strange but uh you know uh i entered this thing sort of from walter white's point of view which is he didn't know a darn thing about the uh, the drug business and and neither did i and and i learned as i went as he learned as he went and uh i i think um you know, you're always looking for uh, moments of showmanship. You're always looking for drama. You're always looking to, lack of a better way to put it, keep people watching, keep their thumbs from hitting that remote and changing to another channel. But, uh, but uh, we've, I think we've tried to keep it as, as authentic as possible and, and not romanticize it. I, I, I would hope that no one would ever watch our show and say, man, that meth looks like some good, good stuff. i got to try some of that because that, that would be... And in truth, I don't think anyone would want to change places with Walter White. I mean, this bastard's on a slippery slope. I mean, he's going to hell. That's no question about it. You know what I mean? I mean so even though you, you see that, but it's, that's, a, that's not a good trade. If I, if I can just add in here, since, the, uh, since Bonnie and Clyde, at least in 67, people have debated whether or not if you have attractive or likable people committing crimes, you know, does that romanticize it sufficiently that people are going to imitate it? And, you know, I, I think that, that Vince Gilligan has really moved the boundary posts here, you know, pushing that about as far as it could 
creatively go and morally and philosophically go. Well, it's, it's an interesting thing. You, 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 I think about movies all the time that, that I love. I was, I was using this example last night. Scarface is a movie I love very much. Uh, it's very operatic. It's very bigger than life. Al Pacino's great in it. I mean, he's, he's, just, he's just fun to watch. I'll watch that movie anytime it comes on. I love watching Al Pacino play Scarface. If, if Tony Montana was a real guy, I would run screaming from him. I would, I would cross the street to, to avoid him. This, it's funny how we embrace, I mean, I'll speak for myself, it's funny how I embrace fictional characters who are bad people indeed, and, and I, and I, I want to watch their exploits, and yet if they were real people, I'd stay the hell away from them. It's, it's, it's funny how we, uh, our fiction uh, in, that, in that sense uh, does not intersect with our lives particularly, but, but I guess we get a, I don't know, I'm no expert on it, but I guess we get a visceral thrill from, from watching at a safe remove these people uh, live lives that we would either be too afraid to live or too uh, repulsed to live or, or, you know, what have you. Hi, um, this is a question for Brian. So I'm curious, since you became a producer on the show and then also directed a couple of episodes, if that, how that affected the time and energy you could put towards being an actor on the show and if that changed for you in a positive way or in a challenging way. Um, well, as an actor, I always give 40%, no matter what. <laughs> I do. I just give it my all. And um, except on ice cream day. Then I go 65. <laughs> you know, I think it's, it's one of those things where if I've, I've always been interested in directing, and I directed a, a little movie that I wrote 13 years ago. And it was one of those things where I had the opportunity, so just throw your hat in the ring. If you're a type of person on the set where you're going, why is he setting up the camera there? Why is that? Why? If you're kind of wondering and curious about it, um, you either have to do it or shut up. Stop talking about it or, or do it. And um, so I, I was able to throw my hat in the ring and, and uh, try to convince Vince that uh, I, I could do it and I wanted to do it. Uh, I, I directed the first episode that you'll see coming back for this last eight. And um, it was great fun. And then producing is, is also an extension of that. You're still telling stories uh, in various ways. And so uh, in, in my case, uh, leading the cast, making sure the cooperation and the, and the uh, communication was clean and the relationship with the crew and keeping everybody happy and everybody going well. And then in post-production, going out and, and promoting, being the face of the of the show and and doing that internationally and you know rah rah that sort of thing. You know, I got to say, I, I love it whenever uh, he directs um, the episode because you you kind of get a, a peek inside of his head, like uh, his process in a way when he gives you know the actors notes or whatever. But uh, you should talk talk to them about what, what what you wore as a director the first day. The first day he, when he was directing the show, he comes in full costume. Like, he has a monocle in his eye. He has a, a little horse, like, whip that he would hit us with. Um, he didn't really hit us, but... Boots and jodhpurs. Yeah, and, I mean, uh, he yeah. was really... Yeah. It was fantastic. Now, now, where do you find jodhpurs nowadays? This oh, you one. find them. <laughs> uh, that's our wonderful costume designer, you know, who can help you find those things. But it's one of those things, you know, when, when, especially when you're directing TV, you don't have time. You, you want to keep it light. Uh, you don't have time to really explore where the, where the characters would naturally go or time. So you basically apologize and say, I have an idea of blocking. Uh, let me tell you what it is and see if it works for you. And, and then present that, and then the actors seem to try to adjust to it. And if it adjusts, fine you're in. If it doesn't, then you have to take the time to figure out, because the most important thing is to make sure the actors are comfortable. If they're comfortable, they'll perform well. If they're not, they won't. So greeting guest stars who come on the show was, a, was out of kindness, just to say welcome, because I've been in that position before, but also to make sure that they start to feel comfortable, because if they're comfortable, they're, they'll perform better, and it helps the show. Hello. 
Hello. So my question is for Brian and Aaron. As actors, what was the process like in developing your characters, both physically and psychologically? Um, I just I just do what Vince tells me to do, you know. I, I really it's it's so it's really so on the page with this particular uh, job. Um, I mean, Brian said this so many times before. You can make great writing great, but um, mediocre mediocre writing you can't really do anything. I don't think I ever said that. Yes, yes. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, I just. I don't know. I, I I do truly feel that I, I well I kind of did live and breathe everything that Jesse went through, but um, I kind of just you know memorize my lines and just kind of show up and. Oh, he's being modest. No, he he, he was uh, very much committed to developing that character and what seems like the simplicity of of Jesse Pinkman, but he's emotion. I mean, really, right? I mean, on the surface of it, but he's emotionally deep. Whereas I think the nice contrast is that when I first started looking into what Walter White was, and I look for the emotional core of a character, because I can then hold on to that. That's something I can grab onto and know. For instance, when I, when I did Hal on Malcolm in the Middle, his core emotion. Yeah. But his, his core emotion was fear. He was afraid of everything, everything scared him. Being a bad father, you know, it, 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 heights, spiders, anybody walking in on him, <laughs> you know, he, he, would, he would just, and so that gave me an opportunity to hold on. You know what I mean? So then the writers start writing toward that, and so now I'm looking for Walter White, and, and I can't find him. I don't know where he is. I can't find, how does he operate? On a day-to-day -day basis, what's his emotion? And I'm looking, and I'm looking, and I'm reading, and I'm, I can't, it's not coming to me. And then all of a sudden, someone was mentioning, I don't know if we were talking about someone else, uh, but someone talked about depression. And it clicked. And I went, oh my God, that's it. I can't see it because he's depressed. He's so depressed that he's calloused over his emotions. He doesn't even know what he feels. He's gone to seed. He was too heavy. He was all those things. The color was out of his skin. His clothes were the same color as the wall. He was, imp it was, it was invisible to himself and to society. And so we started working on that. We knew we were going to shave my head when the cancer started coming in. And that was going to make adjustments. And as far as physicality, I, th I thought of my dad. My dad is now 89 years old. Uh, and naturally has a, <laughs> his shoulders <laughs> hunch over. But I thought Walter White should hunch over too, the weight of, of Walt. So uh, there's a lot of that posture from him as he looks up. It's like his head is too heavy, you know, and, and his shoulders are rounded. So you feel the weight on him, and that felt right. And then when I go into Heisenberg, boom, back it goes. So you, you want to be specific in creating those things so that it's not just an accident or random. It was your idea, the, the mustache. I loved the way you described it. That was not written in. That was, uh, you described it as a dead caterpillar on your upper lip. That's what you wanted. So they, they uh, the hair folks uh, uh, dyed it. Yeah, it was, I, I also describe it as an impotent mustache. Um, so I didn't, know, I didn't know what that meant, but I wanted people to look at a mustache and think, why bother? What are you, <laughs> what are you doing? So I had to thin it, and uh, for men who want to know how to have an impotent mustache, if you, if anybody, show of hands, yeah, oh really, there's some few. Um, you can't have any hair drop down below the crease of the lips. It can't drop there because once it drops past that, it starts to get nasty. So it's got to cut there, and you got to thin it, and then and then we lightened the mustache as well, <laughs> till the point where it's just like, well, um, and then. Through a happy accident, we found the most menacing look a man could possibly have, and that is a bald head and facial hair. <laughs> because hair softens a look. It's like a frame of a, pa uh, of a, of a picture. You, you put hair on, and it softens anyone's look. So to take the hair away, but to grow facial hair for some reason, it's, uh, it's pretty intimidating. And then one last, I loved how you showed up on the pilot, or, or the in pre-production, a week or two before you said, I think... 
Walt wants to be about 183 or 178. What was the number? 186. 186. Because you said at that point, that's where I get a little doughy, I get oh, a little yeah. muffin toppy, and oh, yeah. and you and damned if you didn't show up like like a damn boxer. You showed up like uh, like at the weigh-in at the boxing <laughs> match. You like you showed up right at the weight you said you were going to oh, hit. Oh, I was fun. Eat cheesecake, sure. Give me a cheese. Yeah, pasta, bring it on. Yeah. But then, to, then I lost 16 pounds when we were doing the the sequences where we're under chemotherapy, and you know that's a, it's, so anyway. Uh, may I say, Vince Gilligan, that is not an impotent mustache that you're wearing. <laughs> That's a manly mustache. Um, by the way, thank. That was a. That turned out to be a wonderful question. Thank you. Uh, I just want to end by um, reading again from Brett Martin's book um, when he talks about Vince Gilligan. This is a book that talks about. David Chase and David Simon and other people and Matthew Weiner of Mad Men and other people who are have done brilliant things on television but have not always been the easiest person to work with. The, the sets are very high pressure. This is what Brett Martin said. Uh, Vince Gilligan was, is someone who managed to balance the vision and microscopic control of the most autocratic showrunner with the open and supportive spirit of the most relaxed. I believe that you can feel that as, as unsavory as the material is, that's generosity of spirit, that wonderful open generosity of spirit is in every frame of this show and, and in the, the people indeed that he cast in it. Uh, thank you so much for coming and thank you guys, thank you Apple. Thank you, David. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you.